students who bring in their political views that they have perhaps heard from their parents or, or maybe they're just mimicking them or if they hold them, um, their beliefs can have impact on their friendships, um, on the classroom culture. Teachers also, as the sort of authority figure, um, have to make some sort of decision about what views they, what views they hold themselves and how those enter the classroom, how they shape the space. Levinson is a professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Previously, she worked for eight years as a middle school teacher in the Atlanta and Boston public schools. She has published numerous articles and six books, including No Citizen Left Behind and Making Civics Count. A national leader in civic education, Levinson has served on advisory boards of the Campaign for the Civic Mission of Schools, Circle and Tisch College, Generation Citizen, and the National Action Civics Collaborative. Jacob Fay is a visiting assistant professor of education at Bowdoin College. College. His research synthesizes philosophical theories of injustice with insights from developmental psychology to propose a novel approach to theorizing about injustice. He is co-editor with Mira Levinson of Dilemmas of Educational Ethics, Cases, and Commentaries. Today, they will be discussing their latest book, Democratic Discord in Schools, which utilizes eight normative case studies based on real events to help educators practice the skills they need to instill a sense of civic norms in their students while remaining nonpartisan. So the way that we're going to do today's session may be slightly different than you're used to for a book talk. Um, I am going to talk for about 10 minutes about the book project as a whole. Uh, then uh, Jake is going to um, introduce us to a, one of the cases that's in the book. And uh, we are very grateful that some of you in the audience have um, quite graciously agreed to help us enact the case. Uh, so we'll all experience uh, the case to some extent. Uh, we'll then have a collective discussion about it. Uh, and then um, Jake and I will come back and share a couple of uh, pieces of commentaries about the case. And then we'll go into a Q&A. So it's just going to have a slightly different rhythm than uh, a traditional book talk. But to start with, um, well, let me start my timer so I actually do keep myself to 10 minutes. Um, uh, let me talk about the sort of premise behind the book as a whole. Uh, so it, it is probably useful to know, and this is not meant to plug another book, but uh, that so Jake and I uh, edited a couple of years ago a book called Dilemmas of Educational Ethics, Cases and Commentaries, in which we initiated work around trying to help people grapple in complex ways with complex challenges, ethical challenges in education. Um, educators, parents, policymakers, uh, nonprofit leaders, others, we've gotten really good at talking about a number of the challenges in education around strategy or leadership or instruction or discipline or you know common core, teacher hiring and firing, budgeting, all those kinds of things. But we are not nearly as good or as comfortable talking about the ethical. Uh, commitments that we make in our work. And in particular, we have a tendency when we talk to use ethics as um, a way to grab the moral high ground and to suggest that anybody else who takes a different position from us probably is immoral, right? They probably hate kids or they're unreconstructed racists, or they've been bought off by the teachers' unions, or they've been bought off by Pearson Publishing, or you know whoever it is who our enemy is, that, that's who we claim is the one who does not care about ethics, whereas we ourselves are ethically pure. Well, we've thought for a long time that that's just not true, right? That most of us who care really deeply about educational policy and practice also care really deeply about our ethical commitments in education, about justice, about equality or equity, about fairness, about care, about merit, about accountability, about democracy, about transparency, et cetera, et cetera. But we have different ways of either understanding what those values mean, weighting those values against one another, or deciding, determining how those values apply in a particular case. And of course, it's also not all abstract ethical theorizing, right? There's also a bunch of really concrete challenges that we need to decide that may make us judge differently. If we adopt the school policy, the school assignment policy, are our schools going to get less or more segregated? That's in part an empirical question. But answers to those empirical questions may impact 
are what we then decide is the right thing to do. Well, these differences in what we value and especially how we understand our values and how we understand our values to apply under current con uh, under in a specific context really came to the fore for us even more than they had before after the 2016 election. Right? When we discovered or we were reminded, or it was yet again emphasized to us that we live in a world in which many of us, we share the same uh, community, right? We sh share often the same citizenship, the same country, but we do not share the same understanding of the world. And it's not, again, I think because some of us are ethical and others of us are unethical. That may be true for some people, <laughs> but it's not true for most of us, right? It's that we have different understandings. We may all embrace the value of democracy. We may all believe in justice. We may all believe in uh, accountability, but we understand those values in very different ways. And especially when we are working in a specific context, what we think it means, how we think it applies, how we take account of other forms of evidence in front of us, what kind of wisdom we bring to it, whose voices we listen to, and whose voices we have a tendency to you know, set aside, can really vary radically. And educators find themselves, as they so often do, in the middle of this. Um, and this is because schools, I think, are really, really interesting um, institutions because they have this dual purpose that Jake and I write about in our introduction to this book. One of their purposes is to educate for democracy, right? Their responsibility is to help educate children to grow up into adults who will actually enact democratic values and civic values, and ideally help us become a more democratic and frankly a more ethical community and polity than we are now. So they take a vision of a future that we haven't yet enacted, and we try to input, imbue that in them and say go forth and create a better world than we have. At the same time though, schools are trying to do that work of educating for democracy in the current democracy, right, where there's all sorts of contestation and disagreement about what kind of society that is that we're trying to create in the future, also what kind of society is that we live in now, what our challenges are, what our opportunities are, and how best to understand the ideals and the practices that we should be enacting at the moment. And what that means is that teachers, school leaders, district superintendents, school committee members, parents, right, find themselves in the middle of these often um, opposing and contesting forces, right, where they are trying to take, they have to take a determinate action. They have to say, we are going to partner with the sheriff's office in an anti-gang program even though that brings law enforcement into our schools and we realize that that puts our undocumented kids at risk, or we are not going to partner with the sheriff's program in an anti-gang program, even though we recognize that we have children in this school who were murdered by gangs. Right? That is one of the cases that we talk about in the book. Right? They have to make a determinate decision. They either have to partner or they don't partner. But how they understand that d decision and how that decision enacts certain values is deeply contested by the many, many other people surrounding them, by the parents, by the other teachers in the school, by the sheriff, by the mayor, by the school committee members. And how they navigate that is as challenging as also what decision they make. There are lots of examples of democratic discord in schools and districts and states and nations, many of which are actually quite perennial. So for example, what do you choose to teach in the classroom as controversial or not, right? I assume that we would all judge that we should not teach, that, that we should teach that women and men have equal suffrage rights. That that is not controversial. It's not controversial that women should have equal rights to vote as men. That was controversial 
right, back in the day. It, you're going to hear about this if you come back to Harvard Bookstore in a couple of weeks, right? It's not controversial now, and we should not teach it as controversial. Should the tax cut that uh, the you know Congress's tax cut that was uh, passed last year was that a good idea? That clearly is controversial, and it should not be taught as decisive. We may have specific opinions about it, that it was a terrible idea or it was a great idea, but in a school, say, tax policy should almost always be taught as controversial. But what about, say, students' access to bathrooms that correspond with their gender identity? That is empirically controversial. North Carolina has passed a law that says that districts and schools may not allow children to go to the a bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity if that gender identity is different from the identity, their biological identity. So North Carolina has specified that transgender bathroom access, that bathroom access for transgender kids may not follow their own gender identity, but it must follow their biological identity. And in some ways, therefore, that's off the table in North Carolina. But it's hard to imagine that we would, should treat that in schools as therefore being definitive, that kids should not be able to access the bathroom that corresponds to their gender identity. Massachusetts has passed an opposite law, but it was also controversial. There was, an there was an attempt to get a ballot initiative. Actually, I think it was on the ballot as to whether or not we should overturn that law. Massachusetts citizens said no. Absolutely, transgender kids should have the right to go to a bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity. So again, there's this question. So should we treat this as controversial or not? And there is a lot of democratic discord over that very question, right? What would it mean to treat that as controversial in a, class, in a school that has ch children who do identify as transgender? What will that do to them psychically, emotionally, socially? What does it mean to teach it in a school where there are no transgender identified kids and where it feels abstract and where there is no sense of connection? Should we make different choices you know, it, it's in some ways it seems as if it's even more important to take identity seriously where you do have a sense of connection. That's another case that we have in the book. We have a variety of other cases um, that are meant to sort of help think about the wide variety of forms of democratic discord that play themselves out in schools uh, from very obviously political and democratic ones like teacher speech rights. So we, uh, look, we have a case where we look at teachers who were fired, uh, one for wearing a Black Lives Matter button in solidarity with the 3% of kids who are African American at his school in Clovis, California on election day, and he was fired for engaging in overtly political speech. Um, uh, and we look at other examples of teacher speech and the limits on teacher speech. Uh, so that's like an overtly political case. Others that are not so obviously political, such as the digital surveillance that we engage in of children in schools. So for example, um, uh, right now, Google Classroom, any of you who are parents probably have children who use Google Classroom. There's software that's available that can do automated content analysis of everything that your children type and uh, submit into Google Classroom and then call up uh, anything that seems concerning and spit that to an administrator for review. Uh, kids who use school provided email addresses uh, and then they sync their Snap, their Insta, their WhatsApp, anything they do with that in, uh, uh, email address then may uh, feed into school servers. And so schools are in fact getting hundreds of thousands of students' um, nudie selfies probably every month, right? Because kids are accidentally doing that and then schools have now the burden of deciding what to do about that. So that doesn't, that's not obviously political in the same way, but how we teach children about uh, what kind of surveillance they should be subject to, but also schools' responsibilities to keep them safe is itself a political and a democratic project.
So this book has eight cases, uh, as Jake is about to explain. We're going to take you through one of them. Following each of the cases, there are six commentaries by a variety of people with a variety of disciplinary, experiential, and professional backgrounds. We have a police commissioner. Uh, we have a school superintendent. We have teachers. We have eighth grade students and high school students. We have activists and organizers, sociologists, historians, law professors, you know, a, a wide array uh, to sort of try to push our thinking in various ways around the ethical dimensions of our work. Uh, and so we'll share a couple of those commentaries with you first, but first I'm going to, I mean, in a minute, but first I'll turn it over to Jake for our case. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you everyone for being here. Um, I should just add that, uh, so we are going to be going through a case, and so going through this case in a very interactive way with you, the audience, because part of what these books are about, the reason why we present them as cases, um, with comments from a, a wide range of, of authors and thinkers um, is because we think that ethics is a collaborative democratic project. We don't think that ethics is something, simply something that is passed down from on high. We want it to be a collaboration. We want it to be a conversation. And so we are going to use this case to invite you all into uh, a brief discussion, given our time constraints, um, about a case that we actually are also lucky enough to have one of the authors of it with us today, Tony. Could you say, give him a wave? Hey, Tony. <laughs> um, and so uh, we've asked a couple people in the audience to play some of the roles. Uh, and I will be playing the narrator. Um, and to set the case up, this is a. Uh, this, is a, a, this case is about a school culture committee um, at the Jersey City K through 8 school. Um, and they are struggling with uh, the rise of divisive political rhetoric, um, political polarization, all the, 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 the you know, news headlines that you hear about from day to day, and how they are seeping into schools and shaping the way that school, uh, students and teachers um, experience their classrooms, their peers, um, and the curriculum that they're studying. Uh, so, without ado, um, though it was a late weeknight, the monthly meeting of the school culture committee at the Jersey City K-8 through school was pulsing with energy. In light of a recent surge of divisive language among students, the team of teachers, parents, and the principal was eager to finish drafting the SCC's proposed guidelines for strengthening and evaluating school culture. Jersey City's principal, Ms. Winters, opened the meeting by checking in on an incident that had arisen a few weeks before. How's it going with Danielle and her friends? Are they still ostracizing Danielle because of her family's support for Trump? Or are there Tuesday lunches with you helping, Rob? Rob, the school's social emotional learning coordinator, offered an update. I've been inspired by their willingness to be honest with each other. <coughs> but it's going to take a lot more time and work for their friendships to be repaired. Danielle's friends, especially, but not only her friends of color, just are unable to reconcile the fact that she says positive things about Trump. Teresa, in particular, still can't forgive Danielle for making that comment about criminal illegals, given what Danielle knows about Teresa's cousin. And Danielle is just so hurt that her friends are holding her political views against her, they're all taking these statements very personally. Gregory Timms, a seventh grade father, jumped in. It's hard not to take it personally. White students are the minority at this school, but they are treated like they are the unjustly privileged majority. Colin told me at dinner last night that there are kids in his class who won't work with him just because they know our family voted for Trump. He wants to switch schools, but we can't afford to move to a whiter district or send him to a private school. Susie, Colin's humanities teacher, looked concerned. Well, we love Colin and hope he won't switch schools. I think the problem is that many of Trump's statements are emotionally damaging to many of our students. They lack coping strategies. Madison, a mother of a first grade student, agreed with Susie. Right. How are they supposed to react when they hear their classmates insinuating that they don't even belong in this country? I believe in zero tolerance for bullying. That's the point of this committee, to make sure that JCK8 has a culture we can be proud of, where no child is bullied or harassed. But in these instances, I feel like our kids are having to set boundaries because the school isn't doing it for them. Principal Winters was more cautious. 
I agree our communities need to set those boundaries more clearly, but I worry about characterizing these disputes automatically as bullying or harassment. You know by state law we're mandated reporters for all incidents of bullying or harassment. I don't think we should be reporting and punishing Danielle, Teresa, or Collins' classmates. We should be teaching them how to work together and get along. Do we really want to criminalize what should be a teachable moment? Madison responded, followed by Rob. But we have anti-bullying laws for a reason. and We can't overlook the harm that treating bullying or harassment as teachable moments could have on kids being bullied, especially those from marginalized groups. That would do everything but create a safe space for students to learn. You faced a version of this teachable moment question in your class last week, didn't you, Elena? Yes, we were in the block room, and a small group of boys began building a wall that spanned the width of the classroom. At first, I thought nothing of it, but then they started chanting, build the wall, build the wall. Madison looked appalled. No, they did not. How am I going to discuss this with Marquis tonight? and just before bedtime. I could see that some of my students were feeling uncomfortable, and I immediately called, time out. Normally, I don't interfere with the children's play. They need the freedom to explore, problem solve, and negotiate differences on their own. But this time, something felt different. I couldn't just sit back and watch. I asked them, what are you boys working on, hmm? You know what they told me? We're building the wall to keep the Mexicans out. They were so excited and proud. Susie, who had been wrestling with similar incidents in her seventh grade humanities class, could barely contain herself. I was so angry, I had to pause for a few seconds and just breathe deeply. Then I thought maybe I'd redirect them to a different activity. Say, bring out the paints instead, because after all, they don't know the hate behind what they are saying. But then I felt like, they're in my class now. I am their teacher. It's my responsibility to educate them and help them understand that we should embrace others rather than fear them. So in front of all the whole class, I posed the question, why do some people want to keep other people out? And the kids had so many interesting answers. One girl told me, sometimes you just want to be alone or with your best friends, and so you have to say no to some people. And that seemed reasonable. Felisa said you might keep people out because you have to stay safe, and you don't know if strangers could be dangerous. And then immediately Gordon jumped in and said, because the Mexicans will take our jobs. I turned to Gordon then, and I asked him, what is your job? He looked at me with wide eyes and shrugged his shoulders. I quietly said to my class, your job, boys and girls, is to come to school to learn. And while you are at school, your job is to be kind, to be caring, and to be respectful so that everyone has a safe learning space. Do you think anyone can stop you from being kind, caring, and respectful? And they all said, no! So I said, then nobody can take your job. A long moment of silence followed as people processed Elena's story. Finally, Madison spoke, followed immediately by a very impassioned Gregory. Thank you, Mrs. Morales. You're teaching our children, children what really counts in life, to be kind to each other and to think about their actions. You didn't shame the boys or talk about politics. You just guided them toward their better selves. I know I speak for the families of all the marginalized children in your classroom when I say thank you. Don't any of you see what is wrong here? Those boys were play acting the policies of the President of the United States, and their public school teacher, a state employee no less, leveraged her personal, moral, and political reasoning to stop them. That was a partisan move through and through. The boys were creatively engineering a wall, and they were drawing on their knowledge of current events in the process. That should have been celebrated by the teacher, but instead their entire innovation was discouraged. If you wanted to make it a teachable moment, Mrs. Morales, you could have taken the time to explain to them the difference between legal and illegal immigration. That would have been a good lesson. Principal Winters 
broke the silence that followed. Gregory does have a point. We can't censor student play or creativity just because it happens to disagree with our politics. As I've said before, school needs to be a neutral space, a politics-free zone. A flurry of responses followed from Rob, then Susie, then Gregory, and finally Madison. With all due respect, how can a school be a politics-free zone? What happened in Elena's classroom and with Colin, Daniel, and Teresa shows us that politics will enter the classroom whether we plan for it or not. That's why we set up this committee, right? I totally agree. The purpose of school is to prepare students to be citizens in a democracy. How can we prepare future citizens if we cannot talk about politics? We need to lean into these conversations, not back away. If we're going to lean into politics, let's have our kids study the First Amendment. You can't censor something just because it doesn't agree with you. That's a freedom we fight for all around the world. But these are kids in school. Adults can walk away from offensive statements or people, but our children can't go anywhere. Principal Winters fe finally felt as if she had found her footing again. Madison's right. Students don't have total freedom of speech. We have to be mindful of our state and federal borrowing laws. We can't ignore statements and incidents that create a hostile learning environment and inhibit students' learning, especially since t attendance is mandatory. She's exactly right. Free speech doesn't mean that schools shouldn't teach children how to be kind to one another. Maybe it's my liberal bias, but I'm not going to stop teaching inclusion and social emotional skills just because our national political discourse has lowered the bar below civility. That didn't sit well with Gregory. <laughs> I'm all for teaching kindness. Just don't confuse kindness with political ideology. Democrats don't have a monopoly on good character. Not to mention that your inclusiveness seems to stop where conservative perspectives begin. Those shepherd fairy posters showing everyone except a white male as part of we the people, they're obviously anti-Trump. Let me tell you, Colin notices that his views and people that hold them aren't welcome. Susie was baffled. I hardly think that posters featuring women of color saying things like we the people protect each other and we the people defend dignity are inappropriate. They're simply inclusive. The posters are meant to show all students that we value them as people and that we'll work together to create an inclusive classroom in which everyone's needs and rights are respected. Gregory was skeptical. Would you be <laughs> equally happy to put up a poster of a white man standing up for our Second Amendment rights? Before Susie could respond, Rob intervened. These are great conversations. <laughs> <laughs> but not ones we can resolve in the few minutes we have left tonight. I'm wondering where we stand more generally. Do we have any principles or policies we can agree will improve school culture while respecting student diversity, including political diversity? The end. Can we give a round of applause for our answer? So thank you. Um, we're going to let you take a couple minutes to turn and talk to someone near you. Uh, and the question that we'd like you to think about is, what is the central dilemma of this case? Um, and so when we use the word dilemma, we use it very purposefully. Um, we want you to think about uh, questions in the case where, uh, sorry, hi, Rowan. <laughs> um, uh, questions in the case that where there is no clear right answer, right? Where you look at. Um, a tension between, say, uh, free speech and inclusivity, and you aren't quite sure what, what the right thing is to do, right? Or, uh, so we're asking you to think about um, what are the dilemmas in this case, and for whom are those dilemmas, all right? So turn, take a second or a uh, minute or two and talk with someone near you about that question, all right? Thank you. So we're sorry to have to interrupt. We usually spend a lot more time doing this, but because this is a, ver this is a, a book talk and we don't have a whole lot of time, um, we're going to break up your conversations and just ask if there's a couple people that would like to share out um, some of what uh, caught your eye or, or you left you thinking about with this particular case. Every actor that's in there seems to agree that um, 
if you're going to have a democratic kind of society, a democratic kind of school, people are going to have personal points of polit per personal political opinions. But the problem is that if those personal political opinions come into the classroom, then you seem to be negating democracy, negating the democratic environment, especially if they are the teachers, to some extent. And one way or the other, that you know, the Gregory character keeps reminding them of this and not allowing them to get away from it as they're doing this. Right, and this can play out in different ways with differently positioned characters, in a sense, right? So, um, some, in some ways, students who bring in their political views that they have perhaps heard from their parents, or, or maybe they're just mimicking them, or if they hold them, um, their beliefs can have impact on their friendships, um, on the classroom culture. Teachers also, as the sort of authority figure, um, have to make some sort of decision about what views they what views they hold themselves and how those enter the classroom, how they shape the space, um, but then also um, how do they invite in and you know a range of political views, right? I guess just that all of the views are based on some important principle, but they they clash in this scenario, and so how do you kind of make a hierarchy of which principles? allow in. Yeah, that seems really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that, so that's kind of why we are putting these out there, right? Like, um, we try to build characters that feel less like they're just giving, they're standing in for a, a viewpoint or something like that, and they're actually motivated to, um, to, to say what they're saying. Um, but I think what we try to get people to do through these cases is to, to start making choices about that. How do we uh, rank these? these values, or what trade-offs are we willing to make, right? Um, and, and, and in schools, um, because they are schools, might we do it differently than say we might do it in this bookstore or out in the public space of, of Harvard Square, right? Um, because it is a learning space, right? So maybe that has some other sort of considerations that we need to take into account when we're thinking about how do we balance these important um, but potentially conflicting values, right? I thought the, the point about what, I came in late, but I thought the point about what to put on the wall was really interesting, um, and what like a, a central dilemma of, and we, we were talking about the idea of inclusivity and representation and how that becomes politicized. And I'm a teacher and I would never put the second, the First Amendment poster on the wall and I would like put a Shepard Farley poster in a second. So it's, it's hard to, to kind of parcel through and, and at, in grad school too I always learned like put your values on the wall um, but when do the values seep into politics yeah as a, as a former middle school teacher I remember being told teach with your true self right yeah. Br bring yourself into the classroom teach um, but when that when when the the sort of political valence is being attached to all sorts of things that we may not even think are political um, like these statements about defending dignity, right? Yeah, and uh, so we begin our um, first chapter of the book uh, talking about an incident that a school superintendent brought to me. I was doing a professional development session with a bunch of school superintendents and principals in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And uh, he came to me and he said, all right, here's, this, here's an issue that we've been wrestling with. He said, after Trump was elected, signs started appearing in a bunch of yards that said, hate has no home here, love lives here. And some teachers put those signs up on their walls. All was fine, that was okay. Actually, this was before Trump was elected. This was, I think, in the fall. And sort of, the, I think the signs showed up in the summer and the teachers put them up and, and they were there in the fall. After Trump was elected, interestingly, so some months later, a second set of signs started appearing uh, in this district, which was, I think, a very purple district, which was, love for God, love for constitution, love for country, right? Both signs are talking about love, right? Presumably the first, the people with the first signs also love constitution and country and in most cases God because the United States is a very uh, religious place. Presumably those putting up the second signs also agree that hate has no home here, love lives here, right? 
And there's nothing explicitly being said about being a Democrat or a Republican or pro-Trump or anti-Trump, but you know, you all know, and we all know exactly, right, what the uh, party affiliation of and the voting record was of the people who put up the first versus the second sign. Well, after those second signs started appearing, then the principal and then the superintendent started fielding complaints about the hate has no home here, love lives here signs that the teachers had put up on their wall because they suddenly shifted from being potentially inclusive, solidaristic signs to being politically partisan signs without the text, right, changing at all. And that is, I think, one of the examples of ethical dilemmas around educating and times of democratic discord that we try to illuminate. Um, should we switch over and read? So as I mentioned, after uh, each case, so the cases are designed to be pretty short. They're like five pages long. They're designed so that a teacher team can read them in about 10 minutes and then immediately have a professional development or a faculty meeting or a teacher team meeting about them. But then, if you get the book, you get the benefit also of these uh, six commentaries following each case from diverse perspectives. We're going to read very short excerpts just from three of the commentaries following this case, so you get a taste of what they're like. And I think Jake is going to kick us off with the first commentary uh, from Andy Smerick, who is the uh, president or was the, the president of the State Board of Education in Maryland, and he's also a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Students must be taught that tamping down, tampering down on political difference comes at a steep price. Even if it is done with the best of intentions, for example, using Susie's language, to create a safe environment where everyone is loved and cared for, much is lost. If anyone can invoke the protection of their sensibilities, you can't say that because I find it offensive, to counter an unwelcome argument, then conversation grinds to a halt. A pro-life student will silence a pro-choice student and a vice versa. A student who wants more free trade will stifle the views of a classmate who wants less, and vice versa. If adults are able to pick and choose which positions are impermissible, then we allow their political preferences to shape what's discussed. Perhaps Gregory would be willing to stop students from speaking badly of President Trump. Elena seems willing to stop students from supporting immigration controls or gun rights. Limiting discourse often means privileging certain political preferences. The uncomfortable but necessary approach related to the content of such discussions is to recognize that the vast, vast majority of political views are in bounds, and that when dealing with the substance of those views, educators should aim primarily to help their students become more informed. Obviously, free speech has limits, so some views are clearly out of bounds, such as advocating violence. Schools should be firm around those lines, and the information gathering guided by educators should be developmentally appropriate. A first grader expressing a view on immigration shouldn't be assigned readings about territorial sovereignty under the Peace of Westphalia, but perhaps an 11th grader should. The second commentary is by Thea uh, Renda Abu El Haj, who's an anthropologist um, at Barnard College and who does a lot of work on transnational children's identity. So she writes, how can JC K-8 claim to value and include all students when students like Danielle or Colin feel their viewpoints are excluded? On the other hand, how can the school protect the safety of oppressed groups if it takes a neutral stance towards speech and actions that embed oppressive messages? These educational dilemmas entail two presumed contradictions. First, between teaching as a neutral or a political act, and second, between safety and exclusion. In what follows, I unpack and essentially challenge these apparent contradictions. So first, she challenges the idea that there's this tension between public education as a politics-free zone and one of education as being inherently political. This apparent te tension rests on a misunderstanding. Education is never politically neutral. Educational decisions entail values. From what we choose to include in and exclude from the curriculum, to how we structure classroom communities, to how we organize our schools, we are always making inherently political decisions. Second, I'm jumping here, the question in my mind is not whether institutions must choose between free speech and safety. The question is whether in the face of speech that expresses, for example, racist ideas, Educational institutions take a clear stance on the side of supporting the equality and dignity of all persons. 
This does not necessarily admit, mean always taking a zero tolerance approach to offensive speech. However, it does require that individual educators and their institutions critically address, unpack, and stand against those ideas with clarity and fortitude in order to create a safe learning community that stands on the side of justice. So the last excerpt I'm going to read uh, is by Maisha Cherry, who's an assistant professor of philosophy at University of California, Riverside. Um, and she writes about friendship. However, there is yet another challenge. While the incidents in Jersey City have educational aspects, such as whether to allow kids to build a wall in class, they are also interpersonal in nature. For example, helping kids to repair a friendship. Solutions for the educational aspects may not translate to the interpersonal ones. Because teachers are more, often more equipped to handle the former, I will focus on the interpersonal dimensions of these incidents and examine how and to what extent teachers can help. She calls this the forgiveness angle. Recall that Danielle and Teresa's friendship is under threat. Danielle's family is not only Trump supporters, but Danielle has expressed positive things about Trump to her friends, friends who are also targets of Trump's political rhetoric. Danielle's friends respond to her comments about criminal illegals not just as political expression, but as a violation of the norms of friendship. Danielle knows about the immigration status of Teresa's cousin. She also knows that Teresa cares about her cousin. Danielle, as a friend, should care enough about Teresa to be mindful of what and who Teresa values, and she should respond with care given her knowledge of her friend. We do not know who introduces forgiveness, but the teacher's dialogue indicates that it is the preferable solution. From what Rob describes, the fact that the incident remains unresolved turns on a lack of forgiveness. He even suggests that the problem between Danielle and Teresa is unresolvable unless Teresa forgives Danielle for her comment. However, this view is anchored in the assumption that there is only one type of forgiveness available unconditional forgiveness. Unconditional forgiveness does not require repentance or atonement on behalf of the offender. This view holds that forgiveness is a gift that Teresa gives to Danielle. No other conditions need to be met. Although unconditional forgiveness is not impossible, this gifted forgiveness may not promote the aims the parties want to address. Because they continue to engage in weekly meetings, we are led to think that Teresa, Danielle, and the other students want to continue in their friendship. Repair is the goal. Unfortunately, these meetings have not led to any progress. It is likely that they have been unsuccessful because they are relying on the wrong kind of forgiveness to achieve their goal. Promoting unconditional forgiveness may be counterproductive at worst and unsuccessful at best to the aim of repair. So there are other commentaries to that case and to many others. And at this point, we'll open it up for Q&A. So if I understood correctly, we need to look case by case all these ethical issues. So we need a, lot, a bunch of philosophers and people that can help us unpack every um, moral dilemma that we have in schools. Are there any bottom lines or you know something that we can take home to approach ethical issues on a more general basis instead of like a case by case? That's a great question. Um, so what we've had arguably thus far is an overweight on the general ethical principles that we should all know and understand and be able to apply in every case, right? That's what philosophers, at least in the Anglo-American tradition over the past few hundred years, have spent a lot of time working on, is very high level ethical theories that are supposed to cover everything, right? Um, it is true, there are also traditions that are totally uh, situational, right? And there's a tradition of situational ethics that's like, well, you have to look at every single case and you can't generalize at all. We are positioning ourselves somewhere in the middle, right? We argue in favor of what we call, following Aristotle, a frenetic approach, which is trying to achieve some form of practical wisdom through looking at context specific cases, but in order to try to understand, gain some more general knowledge. Because right, otherwise it might be entertaining to think about case by case by case. But if we don't actually gain any wisdom that we can then apply to new cases, it's not clear that there's a point. So really our, our argument is as much methodological 
as substantive is that instead of just going from these top-down theories, utilitarianism or rights-based, you know, Kantianism or whatever, we should start trying to build our educational ethics from the ground up. And if we work with these cases, then hopefully we can start to understand some theories and principles and practices that we could apply across cases while always recognizing, and this is the reason that we don't have only philosophers commenting on this, right? We also have teachers and school superintendents and historians and so forth, recognizing that there are really multiple sources of wisdom and multiple kinds of knowledge that we should be bringing to even our ethical determinations. Yeah, and I would just second that point that Miro was saying that this is really, it's methodological in a sense, right? Um, we borrow from Aristotle uh, in that we are, we are looking at phronesis or practical wisdom, but we also treat phronesis as frenetic inquiry, right? So what you started here in this conversation, had it gone on, had we had longer discussions about um, what sort of values matter, what should we do in this sort of situation, we think is the way in which um, we start to develop and um, strengthen our ethical insights it's, and, or our ability to um, think and act ethically in the world, right? So that's... I guess just to add to that, the, the conversation going on in the, the scenario, we're all by adults, and a very different developmental level of ethics than the children they were discussing. And I would just kind of caution that we need to take into account developmentally, moral development, not cognitive development or psychosocial, but the ability of the child to morally understand something when those kinds of decisions are made. So there, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. There are a couple of things um, in the longer version of the case that Tony uh, and Sarah and I wrote. There is a discussion where a Susie gets really excited about what Elena did and is like, oh, yes, I'm going to take that and do that in my seventh grade classroom. And Robert's like, whoa, seventh graders are really different from first graders, right? Seventh graders should be engaging. Maybe not with the Treaty of Westphalia, maybe so, right? But like they should be able to think through this and you don't want to just redirect them to we should all be nice and kind, right? So that's one thing is that I think many of these cases raise developmental questions in them. The other thing is really interestingly, so we write these cases for adults. They're kind of by adults for adults with commentaries in the past, like in, in this first book, the commentaries were all by adults. What we've come to discover is that teachers super quickly take every case we produce and they turn them around and they start using them with their students. Their high school students, but also their middle school students. Um, and so that led us both an ethical commitment to student voice, but also realizing that students were engaging with this anyway. In democratic discord in schools, we have um, one commentary that was co-written by a group of five high school sophomores who attend the Met School in Providence, um, uh, which they did as part of a year-long inquiry into political theory that they did with Arthur Baroff, their principal. But then for our digital surveillance case, that, and that's about school walkouts, and they had all participated and organized in school walkouts uh, in Providence, and, and they wrote about school walkouts. Um, then for our digital surveillance case, we solicited a wide array of student commentary and it ended up including six micro commentaries for the youngest contributor was a rising eighth grader so it was the summer after her seventh grade year and she and they all read you know the full case and responded to it in totally fascinating and disparate ways so this eighth grader said we need to be kept safe and we don't know what we're doing and we're probably going to mess up so please watch over us and a high school senior said you can try to watch us, but believe me, like we can get past any filter or any surveillance you think you're going to enact. Uh, somebody else said through, the, through the black magic of a VPN. Right. Yes. Through, yes. It was his language. Right. Another student uh, said, "Look, I'm a student of color in California. I already experience hyper surveillance and um, and hyper uh, sort of discipline." Uh, uh, and if you take this to the digital space, all this is going to do is increase discrimination against uh, and hyper uh, you know, the disciplining of students of color. So a w really wide variety of student responses. So 
developmentally, interestingly, kids, I mean, they recognize that they are the ones implicated in the decisions that the adults are making. And they're pretty ready to like find their voice and engage with them and tell us what we should think. And do the cases travel across border, maybe not too far, for example, to Canada? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, when we originally were thinking about this project, we had thought about it as a project about fragile democracies worldwide. And then we started realizing one thing, most democracies are fragile. Um, and then we also realized that we, we had some cases, but it would be a very large undertaking for us to, to go fully global. But we did take a, a, a baby step because we would like to get there eventually. So there are actually, for the, in this book, um, there are commentators who um, we've brought in from countries around the world, um, from Singapore, from Canada, from England, Germany, um, Germany. Mexico, uh, um, the U yeah. Yeah. So, w and we have, South and they Korea. have, and they have brought in, um, they have been able to talk about the cases and bring in an international perspective. Um, or the, their particular context that often is adds a very unique and new angle to what we're experiencing in American schools, um, but that is relevant and very helpful for the conversations. Um, it, it's but, both unique, but also often it's this translates directly, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And I would say we have an, now a growing international network of educators and philosophers and scholars who are using these cases. So, so. Um, they, in fact, walling off for welcoming in was taught recently in Australia. Um, so there, there are people who are using them in both scholarship and professional development in Spain, Israel, China, Japan, Greece, Germany, Australia, the UK, Canada, Mexico. So it, it's it, interesting because in some ways, in some ways, I think the context specificity actually kind of helps the translation because you can just know, right? Like it, 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 it's, it's one of the reasons that I do think that actually philosophizing from very contextual cases can be quite productive because it's, you know, the more particular you get, this is kind of the historian's insight, right? The more general insight you can also achieve. And so it seems to be easier for people to take these across borders when they can say, clearly, that's just a pathology of the United States. But this, right, you know, we, we see as being uh, translatable to our context. So some of the very fundamental things, like they might disagree with the policies that we have set up around digital surveillance, right? But they might, but uh, across the borders might still be the same thing. Like digital surveillance is still an issue we need to be thinking about, right? We just wouldn't want to think about the way you guys are doing it. Right. School walkouts, you know, now the, I don't remember the girl's name in Sweden, you know, who's now inspired kids from around the world in over 100 countries, right, to walk out of school very specifically around climate change. She was inspired by the kids in Parkland. Uh, and the Parkland kids were themselves inspired by, you know, examples from elsewhere. And so there's now, you know, school, our school walkouts case, interestingly, I think, translates now worldwide in a way that even a year ago it might not have. Great. All right. Thank you so Thank much you for so coming. Thank you so much for coming.